There was, it, it, they're asking about maybe that first question, why did God ask them to kill everyone in various times in the Old Testament? Oh. <laughs> well, they lived in a different world and the world went like this. Um, violence at that point was viewed as a way of cleansing the city that you were capturing. And so um, you went in, you had a command, you went in and you killed every living being in that city. I think that's what you're referring to in this question, partly in this question. And the idea that comes, that the idea that springs from is um, God is commanding you to do a cleansing of that culture or of that city. So how do we work with this today is the issue. How do we read this text today? I'm hearing what you're saying and so I'm thinking this is, I don't even know if this is appropriate to even ask, like Hitler, in Hitler's days, was he like told to do, I mean, it almost sounds like what you just said, it's just like God, you know, it wasn't God that told him, I pray, that, to kill all those people, but in his mind, could it have been? I can't read Hitler. All I can tell you is that in the scripture text, um, that is viewed as an offering to God. And I have to say to you that it's not the only culture in the universe who has interpreted um, offering uh, your enemy, sacrificing your enemy as an offering to your God. Um, human nature seems to have that deeply ingrained concept. <laughs> Pardon me? The pandemic, what we're living through today, is it's not only math, I mean, the numbers are not math, but I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, in reality, it could be at one time, it could be, if you got mad enough, does God get mad? Does he get angry and say, okay, you're not listening? I think we certainly live with a God who presents consequences uh -huh. uh, to our actions. Um, I don't, I don't, honestly don't know. I haven't done the math. If, uh, I mean, I think some people assume that the, the biblical times are more violent uh, than our own times. I don't, I don't really care about, you know, the, the, the math. I, I care about what the stories are doing. Um, I, I care about how the stories function as a mirror to our own, uh, our own society. Uh, our society is, is violent. Our, our games are violent. Our, our movies are violent. Our, my thoughts are violent when I watch the news. Uh, maybe that's a <laughs> sinful thing, um, but the well, the Bible's you know full of. Yeah, for many people, free will is is an acceptable uh, resolution. But the Israelites, you know, had had many thoughts. Uh -huh. on, on how to explain suffering, and uh, you know, I, I I don't know how to summarize the 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 number of them, except to say that there are a number of ways that the Israelites have struggled with how uh, a single God could be in charge of everything and still uh, allow <laughs> uh, a suffering. Um, specifically with violence in the Old Testament, I I do think that it's worth. Um, not that this fixes it, but as a step, it's, it's worth acknowledging that we're talking about fantasy violence. Um, the, the flood is fantasy violence, uh, the book of Revelation is fantasy violence, the book of Joshua is fantasy violence. Uh, and that doesn't make it okay, uh, but it does lead to the question of, well, what are they fantasizing about? Uh, are, are, and I think it, there's no one answer. In the, in the book of Joshua, I think we're looking at people who are feeling insecure in their national security, uh, to say the least. I mean, you know, I'm not going to start talking about the Assyrians, um, but the fantasy that if only 
we could trust in our God, then we could defeat armies 100 times bigger than us. That, that's not a bad fantasy. I mean, that's not, that's not wrong. Uh, you know, I think for people living under Assyrian oppression, the idea uh, that, that uh, God is more powerful than the Assyrian Empire uh, was, was affirming. Um, you know, the book of Genesis, the idea that there are consequences to our actions and, and that, that the ecosystem can suffer along uh, with human beings because of the sins of human beings. Um, I mean, the book of Jubilees, which I'm an expert in, feels like this is a huge problem and, and goes out of its way to say that, that the cows were sinning too and therefore they deserve to drown uh, in the flood. But if you just look at Genesis by itself, human beings cause the death of all species, uh, all you know, land-breathing, air-breathing species. There's pretty serious consequences to our actions. I'm not gonna go through the whole catalog, but there was so much interest in the book of Revelation, and I, I might be the only one, I might be the one best equipped to say this, uh, because I am a, a single passport, uh, mostly lived in one country my whole life, I mean, did a junior year abroad, um, Anglo, American, whatever. Um, I don't know if anyone else can say as bluntly as I can, that when I read the book of Revelation and I hold it up as a mirror to myself, I see the United States of America. The book of Revelation is about, it's not about violence. I mean, violence is in there. It's about glory. It's about true glory and false glory. And the true glory is the glory of God and the false glory is the glory of the empire. Who's the empire that, that, that bullies the world? Who's the empire that projects might makes right and might makes glory? Who projects uh, wealth and prosperity and free sexuality, uh, you know, sexuality without love. Uh, it's, in the perception of many countries that I've traveled to, it's the United States of America. And I cannot read the book of Revelation without saying, oh, shoot, you know, this is, this is bad. You know, the glory that we think we have, the power that we think we have, the pleasure that we think we have, it is not the real glory. And there's going to be consequences to that. Uh, you know, fantasizing that our God is, is not going to be out-violenced. Yeah, I, I can see the theological problem with that. I mean, it, it, it's not great to say that our God is better at being violent than your empire. And yet it's, it's true. You know, God of Israel ain't nothing to mess with. Uh, you're not going to defeat the God of Israel with a bigger army or a sharper sword or, or more willingness to use it. Whatever power you think you have from, from military might, it's not gonna win the day. You're gonna lose. That's a scary message. Not because I'm afraid of being killed. Uh, I, I'm afraid of being judged as the killer or complicit with the killers. I'd like to um, respond to your question with another story from Genesis. That's the story of Abraham standing in front of Sodom and Gomorrah and saying to God, well, if there are so many, let's say 25 people who are righteous, would you stop from destroying this? And they go down the list of numbers and, um, and God says, well, even one maybe. Okay. So I think it's important to see that text and see that there is a human dialogue going on there with God about destruction um, and how we perceive destruction and how we get implicated in not being part of the destruction of cities and um, the environment and places like that. Okay. I would like to add that um, um, as, as, as Professor Hanneken was saying, uh, we have to distinguish between fantasizing and reality. And, um, and we need fiction in our minds, and we need, we need to be able to project, as human beings, we need to project, uh, but we need to be aware of those projections and not confound them with reality. And that's, that's the trick, that's the, slip, the slippery slope that can end in Holocaust or can end in, in, um, in uh, genocide. Um, and we have to be careful about that, not only towards the Old Testament, 
even in Revelation, you know, um, uh, or even in the New Testament and, and in, in, in our faith in Christ, you know, Christ the King, our, our image, the kingdom of God, and, and, and thinking of God as a king um, uh, has its, its risks. Uh, it, it's got its riches, but there's, there's a risky, there's a double edge. Uh, it's a double edge sword. So we have to be careful of what, you know, what we are looking at. And, um, and the, in the book of Revelation, um, you have that violence or that potential for violence um, uh, carefully qualified when, when uh, um, the victorious lion of Judah, lion, you know, image of, is a slain lamb. And where, as I said, the, the victorious horse rider of the end is trenched in his own blood. And, and his only weapon is his tongue. So, so it's, it's, uh, Revelation is also, uh, uh, I would say, um, turning our military fantasy of the heavens and of God's might and so on, and rerouting it into the right direction of uh, wholesome witness, um, integrity, as I was saying before, you know, against prejudice, against uh, everything that, that, that destroys the earth. And, um, and so, um, so just we have to be careful with how, how do we uh, understand what, it, what are the images we use for God, for salvation, for, uh, for pl cleansing, for purity, and not to, not to uh, make them idols, idols of, of, of God. Um. Go ahead, brother, what are you going to say? I think we, <laughs> we took a long time for one question or two questions, maybe just to add a little a short point, or uh, Dr. Hennigan mentioned it, uh, you know, his uh, personal way of reading the uh, book of Revelation. That's interesting, a new eye for me. And uh, this is how uh, I um, read the book of Revelation. At the beginning, most of the time, it, for me, it was the most book which, is, which was avoided for, <laughs> for my personal reading. But I had to answer young people on my ministry, so I had to dig on. So the first thing I had to do was to start with the, passage, the passages that I could understand. So I started to, to see the setting, all the, uh, the Sunday setting, and all the images, the incense, you know, the heavenly images and the sacrifice. And that gave me a good image because uh, I'm from the Eastern Catholic Church rites, so our church, all the world is surrounded by images. There is no open world inside the church. Everything is covered with image, and you know, different images, and it gives you the sense of what is the book of Revelation is saying. Oh, this is about my liturgy, I said. Then the second day, I had to uh, go through the images, the meaning of the images. And that went well, but I still had difficulty because there was, in, uh, there was uh, overlap of images, overlap of symbolisms. You mentioned the white horse. The white horse is in chapter 19, white horse in chapter 6. There is overlap. There is overlap of the red colors. There is overlap of uh, uh, representing by lion. So those was a kind of challenge, but I had to work also with them. At last, the main thing which was a challenge for me was um, how to interpret the conflict, the violence. It was not difficult for me because my setting was inside the church. So it gave me this spiritual way of approach, and it was easy for me to conclude that, yeah, my life is, um, uh, I have to fight against those who come to attack me, against all temptations. So that gave me a good 
friendship with the book of Revelation. And uh, that reminded me our discussion on the second panel. We were discussing about all this uh, LGBTQ, homosexuality, also we can add abortion, all moral questions. Um, Antonio mentioned that the main point is not about these questions. We are asking about love, he said. Yes, um, the main thing we need in life is not uh, to know what should I do on this moral issue. Do I have the personal relationship, personal encounter with God, with Jesus? So uh, this is my relationship with the book of Revelation. And uh, we can have different interpretation, but always how do we approach the Bible is the main guide for us. Thank you, brother. Uh, my question is, uh, as far as uh, pre-tribulation and tribulation and the thousand year reign and um, the, uh, the being caught up with Christ, how do, what's, what's the Catholic position on those, those uh, subjects? I'll go if you don't like Go ahead, um, I, I think it's going back to the days when they were even debating whether the book of Revelation should be in the New Testament. I think, uh, I think you know, church leaders such as St. Augustine of Hippo uh, were, were clear that, that these are, are truths that are not to be um, taken as reverse history. It's not, a, it's not a Polaroid picture that hasn't been taken yet. Uh, it's, it's a meaningful message that, that reveals um, the, the nature of our struggle. Uh, it reveals the nature of our God. Um, but it, to me, reading the book of Revelation is fascinating and it, in a totally different way. Uh, studying the history of interpretation of the book of Revelation is fascinating. Um, it's, it's, it's sometimes sad how many people you know, died thinking that, oh, it's the year 999, you know, something's gonna happen. It's the year 1666, something's gonna happen. It's the year 2000, something's gonna happen. Um, you know, it ranges from funny to, to not funny uh, in being sad. Um, because I think, you know, human beings have such a desire for, for certainty uh, and the idea that we can just pick it up and read it and believe it or do it and that's it is, is tempting, but, it, but the Catholic way of approaching scripture has always rejected that. Reading the Bible is hard. You, it, the Bible does not interpret itself. The Bible argues with itself. Uh, you need help, you need tradition, you need reason to, to study the Bible. You can't see it as a reverse Polaroid picture. Um, and I think one especially dangerous interpretation in our own times, and I don't mean, I mean obviously when people sold all their crops, their farms and everything, and went and stood on a hill waiting for to be sucked up into the sky, uh, you know, that was sad too. Um, but what I think is dangerous today is, is all forms of use of, of the message of Christ uh, to, to, to promise um, immunity from suffering. Uh, whether it's the prosperity gospel or whether it's the rapture, it's very tempting to say, oh, but I'm not going to suffer. I'm, I'm going to be okay. Jesus is going to just suck me up in a tractor beam or whatever. Uh, and pull me out of suffering, and I'm not going to experience it. That is not what the book of Revelation says. It's not what the Thessalonians says. It's not what the Catholic Church has ever said. You can expect suffering if you're going to be a follower of Christ. And anyone who promises you, oh, I can get you out of suffering, that, that's a charlatan. I mean, it's, I, I do everything I can to respect uh, you know, different views. Uh, different interpretations of Christianity, but, but that one I think is dangerous. I think the prosperity gospel uh, and, and immunity from suffering uh, is a dangerous message. I would add, um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Harnikin. I, I would add, uh, remember um, Antonio spoke about how approaches to, to read the Bible um, that, that are respectful of uh, not only our Roman Catholic tradition, but the Bible itself, and paying attention to the text, to the full text, to the full context. 
So, you know, when, you, when you're trying to zoom into just one factor, like, you know, the thousand year uh, reign and so on, and you, don't take, uh, and you don't take the whole book, then you miss something. And one thing that w we, sh we saw, there were seven seals, there were seven trumpets, you know, there were seven um, cups. And, and, and we see, we seem to, to be seeing, uh, we, we seem to uh, attend a reenactment of what has happened before. It's like cyclical. It's not a, a linear story of uh, deliverance, but it, 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 is, it is cyclical. Um, so that thousand year within the context of the book is also a pause. Like we had a, you know, the seven seal and silence, and there's, there's like a break. But that, that cyclical aspect of it, that, that, that we're trying to get over our violence, our disregard for God's will, and, uh, and that we, we have to a second, a third, fourth attempt, that the judgment and deliverance comes uh, at, at the cost of suffering and with time, with perseverance, that's part of the message of Revelation. So you have, you have a, 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 the fantasized combat, right, of good and evil, and then the reign of Christ, and then again Satan is released. So it's, it's that idea that it's, it's almost never over. You know, it's like, we, we, it's not linear. And, and we have to accept our place with, 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 the, with the fifth seal revealed, right? Um, yes, we are witnesses. Jesus is the first witness. And yes, we, we, we suffer in our witnessing and are in our frustration at things that are not changing as, as, as we hope for them to, to change. And if Revelation is a book of hope, it's because it shows that the story doesn't end there. It continues, and 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 uh, and God embraces all that suffering, and, and and as as Revelation says, wipes every tear from our faces in the end. So, you see, putting it within the context is not just trying to find in the calendar where where is the thousand year reign, but it's understanding the logic of the text, the genre of the text, the way the text is written. heavy. Um, I just wanted to know if y'all could share your thoughts about um, why it seems like God has chosen um, violence as an image of like how damaging uh, sin is. Um, I mean, just thinking about like animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, Jesus' death itself was very violent. Um, yeah, and I think just kind of, I mean, even hearing Jesus say, you know, you've heard it said to you, do not kill, but even just being angry is in itself violence. I guess maybe a better question is just, maybe what is it about sin that makes violence make sense to us as an image of it? I'm happy to try, but I've been talking a lot. I'm reminded by um, by your question uh, about the story of Cain and Abel, um, the first violent sin in Scripture, and it's a sin that revolves around who sacrifices better. <laughs> who sacrifices better, yours or mine? So I kill you because yours isn't as good as mine. And suddenly we have almost, you might say, the first religious violence <laughs> in, in scripture. Um, but before I want to bring that into context, I was listening to what you both said, and it strikes me that the book of Revelation is also about a longing of the human heart um, to share the table with God to be with God, and so it's significant that the first violent sin in Scripture is all about um, a fight over who sacrifices better. You know what I mean? It's weird. Um, 
I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent. There's a book called La Violencia in the Life of the People. It's published by the Society of Biblical Literature. And it's all about how um, in Latin America, violence is um, a political term. Okay? It's a political term and it's used scripture to, and scripture has been used to support the use of violence in governance. Okay? I don't attribute that to God. And um, I'm almost 100% sure when I read scripture that if there is violence that's attributable to God, it's like the ultimate, um, the last resort. It's not the first thing God goes to. And yes, scripture, especially the Old Testament, is full about the anger of God. But would you not be angry if a person you loved was mistreated? Uh, would you not be angry that um, the world that you created is being destroyed? Um, so I think what's underlying all of this is there's a deep caring of God for the world. And there's a deep longing in the book of Revelations and in some of the prophetic texts to exist in that place with God. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, two points I would like to mention. And the first point, uh, theology of pedagogy, I would uh, just want to leave that point for my professors. Um, to help me, but I will continue with the second point, and that is, at the end, God did not reveal himself by violence. He reversed all the violence by being vulnerable. He, he revealed his power to us by being vulnerable. He emptied himself. He became, um, yeah, he emptied himself. Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 6 to 8. Jesus came to us by emptying himself and by dying on a cross, he became vulnerable. And that he, there on the cross, he showed us his power. So he did not reveal himself by the violent way that we see, we experience in the Old Testament. So it became on the other way around. But how does, how did this come into that uh, uh, different position? And that's why I point to that pedag uh, theology of pedagogy. If you could elaborate more on that way, how God educated the people of the, his people so that uh, to prepare themselves to realize the revelation of God and to come into full communion with Him. I'd like to say that God is a good pedagogue. God starts where we're at. It really does. Mm -hmm. She really does. Start where we're at. These people think violence is good. So let's start with that. And move forward and the reason I'm saying this is when I teach scripture people are often surprised by the fact that monotheism for example who God is monotheism is something that we came to in stages why because God started with the cultures where they were at, where they were at and moved them forward is that a kind of what you're thinking yes is? exactly yeah. thank you Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try. I'll try to be brief because I'm not saying to say anything that new. But I think it's. I think it's human beings that that that, that have uh, this very limited vocabulary of emotion, <laughs> and and you know we only have a few really deep. <laughs> you know, I mean, love is obviously one of them. Uh, you know, sexuality, of course, is is, is somewhere on that on that map. Uh, but you know, our feelings of of, of violence 
are, they can't be ignored. I mean, I can't imagine a Bible that would, that would succeed uh, without acknowledging that part of the human experience and giving voice to that, uh, that, um, that part of us. But I think the Bible is also very clear of, of where violence belongs. It is not from God. Uh, in the Babylonian creation story, uh, violence precedes uh, human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Israelite creation stories, there's no violence until human beings uh, come along and introduce it. Uh, and you know, the Bible does say you shall beat your, 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 uh, your, your, uh, plow, your plowshares into swords, and it also says you shall beat your swords into plowshares. Uh, you know, it acknowledges violence, and it gives a step forward. It gives the hope uh, at the end of Third Isaiah, uh, at the end of the Book of Revelation. You know, there, there is a resolution to violence. It's not only celebrating violence. It's meeting that human need for violence and then resolving it in a nonviolent way. Yes, I, I do hear, I do hear uh, your concern. And uh, because we were speaking about images of God and how, you know, what would we delve into in the Bible? And there are violent images, I mean, um, more or less violent. Uh, and, um, um, but we have to see the whole. And as, as Professor Hanneken is saying, uh, uh, the resolution that is looked for. Revelation is a dynamic thing. It's not a one text, one shot thing. And, and something that uh, I really appreciate in the Bible is how God himself resists to our, um, our tendencies and how he, he concedes. Um, he makes concessions. You know, this, this thing, uh, Jesus the Christ, a king, David, a king. Well, monarchy was not God's ideal for a government. No. And yet now, you know, it's such a category, a religious category. But he resisted. He, don't you guys go come, coming, uh, asking for a king. He will take your wives, he will take your lands, and you know, you were out of Egypt. You, there you had a pharaoh over there, and giving you a 12 tribes, and you want a king. Mm -hmm. And so, so God, so even though we have David and glorified, and, and we have, he, Jesus, he should be our king, and still there is that resistance of God. Same thing, first creation account, there's not even violence among, amongst the created beings. Everybody is vegetarian, mm -hmm. no bloodshed. And then it, 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 it all evolves until God witnesses how much bloodshed from Cain on there has been uh, and decides, you know, to to, to, um, to start all over again after the flood, and then he makes a concession. And then he says, okay, you may eat the flesh of animals. I, it's like God saying, I realize there's that violence in you, mm -hmm. and then he's containing the violence and, say, and saying, in this way, uh, uh, not any way, and you know, a sacrifice, recognizing the value of life, and, and, and so on. So it's not that God enjoys the sacrificing of animals or that God enjoys the violence that is perpetrating. He's conceding again and trying to, as Renato was saying, as, as Dr. Fuss was saying, trying to meet us where we are and, 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 and call us into, in, into, into growing to more, into growing into a better anthropology, into going into a better understanding of our relationship with the earth, we keep talking about our salvation and we don't speak theologically about what's, what's with the salvation of the created universe. What about you know, animals and plants and, um, and the, 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 the richness of life that God has uh, lavished upon us? Um, so there's much more theological work to be done than what is already in, that is there in the Bible. The, we have to move on. And, uh, and see the thrust that is there, the powerful thrust, the spirit that is there, but that does not stop there. And um, so beyond those limited images and representations of salvation, of God, of cleansing, of uh, sacrifice, into purer ones, into new ones, into uh, bolder and, and broader ones, that, that move away from a violent representation 
uh, into into better better framework.